uh, from the library. I work with undergrad students there. I'm kind of a generalist, so I don't specialize in any one subject. Um, I kind of do a little bit of, of everything uh, at not a superficial level, but I can hand you off to our subject specialist. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what our subject specialists can do because I know, I, I think, looking at the list of, of your majors and interests, you're really spread out across a lot of different majors, right? So. Um, I would say I'm a great starting point for your research interest, uh, ways to get started, and then I can kind of hand you off to just people who specialize in finding and getting information in the experience. Okay? So we'll spend the next 45, 50 minutes or so talking about the library. Um, it seems like it's always a tough go, right, after lunch in a warm room and you're talking about the library. So I will be yawning, you will be yawning, but I hope this is, I know it's going to be useful to you. Um, ways to kind of get you started on finding uh, resources, kind of get the ball rolling uh, on your research, and then ways to kind of keep that momentum going. So um, I want to start off by asking a question. Why libraries? Why do we need libraries? Do we need libraries? Do we need academic libraries? Any takers? Why is that building, and not even just the building, but the resources we have access to, why has that not been replaced by something like Google? There's no right answer. I don't know. But I want to hear your take. What's the question? satellite uh, branch libraries. We've got two buildings off campus literally filled with books. Uh, so we have the physical items. So that's part of it, especially if that stuff hasn't been digitized yet. So that's that's definitely the part. Support, access to physical items that you might need. Yes, sir. And the library also gives us actually a lot of electronic resources. Like they can be like the place that goes to find like resources that we may not be able to find on Okay. Electronic digital resources that you couldn't get to otherwise, even in many cases through Google, right? So that's how I differentiate it, right? Google is a phenomenal tool. It's easy to use. I use it every day. I'm guessing many of you use it every day. Um, it is fantastic for a lot of things, but especially simple questions, right? So I need a movie review. I need to find out how to get somewhere, a direction. I need questions answered that have a yes or no or specific fact answered, right? But what you're doing now, your research, you know, whether you're in the middle of it or you're planning it, that's a whole lot more nuanced than a yes or no type question or something that just needs a fact, right? Something that you can check on Google. So the library's resources come into play because they provide access to um, mostly high quality research materials, right, in print and online, and they're going to help you answer these complex research questions that you come up with, right? They're going to lay that groundwork. It sounds like this morning you were talking about maybe some research methodology, you know, thinking about how you can actually do um, the lab work, the field work, the experimentation. How do you answer those questions in a setting, a lab setting or a field setting? I would say that library resources or information in general is absolutely going to play a role across that entire spectrum of your research process, right? It might be a good place to start. You might just be reading a textbook or a general reference book or a Wikipedia article, right? Something's going to get you started and get you interested in asking a question on the maybe personal experience. You are going to follow that up by laying the groundwork and better understanding that topic, right? Have you guys looked at a journal article yet, an academic article? Okay. So, Chances are, depending on where you're at in your, your schooling, right? if you're a freshman, you may not be as familiar with the technical language and the jargon that comes with the discipline. right? So you start speaking a different language when you are a senior in physics, a senior in chemistry, a senior in human sciences, and you're there. Right? You're speaking these different languages that you almost certainly didn't know as a freshman. right? And so you're becoming more well-versed in these 
these topics. So it is a, a continuum from knowing nothing or little nothing to being a functional, productive researcher. And part of that is finding information to help you fill in the blanks and lay that groundwork. Okay? Um, we're going to return to that discussion about language in a minute as well because the language that you use in your disciplines is very important for searching for information, whether it's in Google uh, or on the library's website, okay? One other, I think, pretty obvious difference between uh, Google and a library resource, we'll take a look. Does anyone want to give me, I don't know how far you are you along on your, your journey to a research topic, but does anyone have any ideas about what you want to research, what you're currently researching. Simplified for someone who doesn't speak that discipline. Because my typical search is just dogs. And that's not a great search. Adult language disorders. Okay. So let's try. A search for this on our library's homepage, right? Well, I'll explain what we're going to see when we get these results in a moment, okay? So, adult language disorders, I have about 245,000 results from our library. These results could be an e-book, right? So there's a handbook of adult language disorders, online access, okay? That might be an excellent starting place, depending on where you're at in your process, to figuring out, oh, here's the wide spectrum of these disorders. I can narrow it down to figure out what I'm interested in. So that helps lay the groundwork. Um, you've got print materials, right? We will have journal articles, right? This is an article called Pragmatics and Adult Language Disorders from a journal called Seminars in Speech and Language. So what that basic search does is it searches through a whole bunch of stuff. E-resources that the library pays through in part through your library feed, um, print materials and journal articles, things like that. Okay, so again, we have about two hundred forty-five thousand results. If I plug in our same search, right, adult language disorders into Google, I get one hundred ten million results. Right. So the library does a lot of the work of is pulling out some of those resources that maybe aren't as high quality or aren't as relevant, right? It's going to be more academic in nature. So the, depending on the nature of your need, your information need, it's going to dictate the resource you go to. And I compare information resources to stores, thank you. Um, information stores, right? I go to Walmart for a lot of different things. I go to Walmart to buy chips, milk, diapers, diapers for my baby, a tire, a board game, a video game, uh, what else can I get there? T-shirts, sweatpants, a little bit of bookshelf, a little bit of everything, right? So Walmart is a very, offered a broad set of resources, but nothing in depth. So I'd say that's a lot like Google, right? You can get a whole lot of little bit, or a whole little bit of a lot, okay? Now, if I want to renovate my kitchen, do I go to Walmart? Then where would I go? Lowe's. Home Depot, Ace Hardware, right? These specialty stores are more like a library catalog or a library database, okay? So we provide access to hundreds of databases, okay? Some of these databases are really specific, like uh, Agricola deals with agriculture, okay? I'm not going to find stuff on U.S. history. I'm not going to find stuff necessarily on the Vietnam War in Agricola. Now, I might find something on the Vietnam War dealing with uh, Agent Orange. Has anyone heard of Agent Orange? Like deforestation or defoliation um, chemical that they used in the Vietnam War. That might be in Agricola because it deals with an agriculture topic, right? So, that's more like Lowe's or Home Depot. I have a specific need, I need ag materials. I'm going to go to a group one, okay? We have stuff on American history, physics, chemistry, education. I mean, the, the entire spectrum of academic disciplines represented at OSU is covered in this database list, okay? Yes? 
So like, um, there's a database for like, uh, like journals from all over the country. It, it all over the world. Right. So it depends. We won't get too far into the weeds on this because it gets into complicated issues of like licensing and how much we're able and willing to pay. That dictates the level of access we have um, to a certain number of things. So for like a Bricola, let's take a quick look. We've got these little information buttons. And so it's going to tell us, sometimes it gives us numbers, but it gives us a little bit of more information. So this database is created by the National Agricultural Library. And it's a combination of two databases, an online public access catalog and a journal article citation index. Okay? And so they're going to cover all these topics that are listed. So what that's telling me is they're going to make, give me access to some journal articles, but they also might just give me citations or abstracts. And then you guys talk about you know, the parts of the articles. Um, so in many cases, whether you're looking at Google, Google Scholar, has anyone played around with Google Scholar before? Okay. Um, you won't always hit on the actual article, right? This one right here. This will not always be the immediate result of your search. There may be one or two, maybe three or four more steps in that process because this has value, right? Someone is likely going to keep it locked away, right? The reason you have access to a lot of this stuff right now is because you're a college student who's paying fees that go to buy this stuff, right? If you aren't a college student, it would be much more difficult to access a lot of this stuff. Now, you go through your public library, um, you could pay individual subscriptions for journals if that's important to you. They're expensive, very, very expensive. So, why are they so expensive? And this is kind of crazy because I'm looking at one on concussions and the example I always use is on concussions. Let's say we've got an institute, a sports medicine institute here on campus, right? They're looking at um, concussion treatments, okay? Who is that valuable to, that information? multiple entities, right? I think maybe it's most important to an athlete, right, who's going to be protected by the study. But also, who stands to benefit from that? Uh, well, let's say the NFL, right? In recent years, they've had much more a spotlight on player health, concussion issues leading to traumatic brain injury, um, issues way down the road after they've left football, emotional distress, psychological distress, um, suicide, depression, all this stuff, okay? The NFL has a lot of problems, but one of them is that people might not watch the NFL if they're more concerned about player health, okay? The NFL stands to lose money from viewership, um, promotions, you know, selling ads. They stand to benefit from concussion research that helps develop better equipment for their players. The players are safer. And not necessarily because the NFL cares about the player health, but they care about the money generated through the viable NFL league, right? So that's just one example um, of how research can provide value, not just to the researcher, not just to maybe someone, a patient in that case, um, but to provide value to uh, maybe a private entity or a business, okay? And so since that research has value, it takes time, it's sometimes years to complete the research, so someone's getting paid for that. Uh, and in many cases, the university itself isn't the only one paying for that research. Maybe the NFL has actually kicked in some money to pay for it as well. Maybe the researchers have obtained a grant, you know, a, a big bowl of money that they can use to start up a lab, pay for a graduate, uh, an undergraduate teaching assistant or research assistant. Uh, they're taking time to write that article. They're trying to get it published. I don't know how much you talked about the publishing process for journal articles, but that takes a while, right? I don't just write up an article on concussions and I send it to the, let's see, remember this is BJ Sports Sport Med. Um, I don't just send it to them and they say, yeah, this is great, we're going to publish it, right? They send it out for review, right? I'm, they're going to send it out to other concussion specialists. Those specialists are going to take a look at it and say, ah, I don't know about this, this doesn't seem right, this needs to be repeated, you know, verified, all these issues that might come up. 
And then once that's kind of gone through and uh, approved, only then does it go out. So this might be multiple years. It's a long process to get this stuff published. Okay? So someone that invests a lot of time and effort and money into it, they're going to try to keep that locked down, right? And maybe make some of that money back. And it's not always the researcher who gets paid, right? Iverson, Brooks, Lovell, and Collins aren't making money every time you read this article, right? The publishers of this journal are the ones making money, maybe through a database. So there are, there are multiple parties making money off of this stuff, okay? And that's why, one of the big reasons why we can't access everything still through Google, right? Because there's money to be made. There is value attached to this information. So that's why I always tell students, you know, never rely just on one resource. Don't rely just on a Google search. Don't rely just on a library search. There's never going to be just one option that meets all of your needs, okay? And there's never going to be just one search that meets all of your needs, okay? We can't just rely on adult language disorders, and that's going to be our only search statement, okay? We're going to change that up. Um, as you become more specific on what disorders you want to look at, you're going to plug that in. You want to take, and, and Google knows this, right? See, it's filling in a lot of options for you. And that doesn't mean those are the right options, but they're options. And what you do to make a good search is to fill in the blanks, right? Make that search precise, simple. You don't want to ask questions like you do with you know, Siri and Google, right? We can ask them, ask Siri a question. Serial gives a response. Library resources are much more specific. They're not as flexible as something like Google. So if you want to be precise, you want to plug in synonyms or related terms that uh, would be good substitutes in that search statement. And then one of the biggest factors in this is pulling in your academic language, right? That disciplinary jargon that you'll get more and more of right as you progress through your time period. So what I usually say is make it sound more academic. Okay? Take something that's kind of everyday language you would use with someone who doesn't know about language disorders and change that into something more specific. Okay? And that's going to help with any search. So you're going to find better results in Google with a more precise search. You're going to find fewer results, which is usually a good thing in Google. And in this case, this was a good enough, like, good enough search to get those scholarly articles too. So they go ahead and link you right to Google Scholar, right? Okay. So to jump back here, we talked about overlap between and overlap and differences between databases and Google, uh, library resources and Google. We talked about the value of research. We kind of touched on some of these you know, starting points. You know, maybe finding a good general, what we call it, reference word. Um, I, even, I, I tell students to use Wikipedia all the time, depending on where you're at in that topic. Right? So for me, adult language disorders, if there's a Wikipedia article dealing with that, that'd be an excellent starting place because I have next to no knowledge of that topic. And what that's going to help me do is build up that knowledge. And what is at the end of every Wikipedia article? Source and citations, right? Those are going to lead you in other direction. Lead you to better other sources that can help build out your idea of what that topic is all about. Okay? Um, now, of course, you don't want to use Wikipedia as your final source, so we're going to start you know, delving into the academic articles and things like that. But where do you, you know, where do you start? And where and how do you search and for what? I'd say there's no one place that's better than any other location, right? A Google search is an excellent starting point. A library catalog search is good. These databases are good. The problem with databases is typically they're going to lead you into that stuff that's more advanced if you're not familiar with the language yet. It, it feels like wasted time, right? You're going to spend hours finding some stuff, and you're not quite ready for it. Um, so know yourself, know where you're at, know what you're ready for, okay? and you need to find more efficient. So just remember here on the home page, this big bar right here tells you what you're looking at. Some books, articles, and more. 
So it's going to look, going to look in some of these databases. Now remember, we have hundreds of them. It's not going to look at all of them. So don't assume that you're going to see everything that you have just through this one search. You're going to see stuff in the most popular of our databases. Okay. Now, if you know that there is a particular journal that you value in your field, you can actually jump right into that fine text journal or full text journals. And you can actually, let's see if the adult language disorders. So nothing there, but we can plug in language disorders and we discover that there are two, now there are way more than two, but there are two that have language disorders somewhere in either their title or their information about it. Okay? So if you're interested in concussions, type that in. Neurology, type that in. Okay? So this will just give you an idea maybe of a few options that are available uh, on journals and academic research in that field. Okay? Just one option. Okay. So, so this is like Are we only able to get information from English speaking countries or is it like translated or like also in the same language we can find in your translated stuff is harder to find. You can definitely find materials in other languages. Um, most of the databases are largely English language. If you find okay, there are some ways to expand the language options in the databases so you can do that. Uh, but then translation is an issue because there's so many, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of articles out there. In translation, time and money, but it all goes back to that. And so in some cases, you'll find a translated article, especially if it's pretty popular. And it's been translated from another language in English. But it's pretty difficult. So you could, depending on your own language skills, you use a translation word. I wouldn't trust Google Translate to do the heavy lifting in that case. Um, but it could maybe get you started. Uh, but there's definitely some other non-English language options. Yes. What would be the difference uh, from me searching for something on that big body service and then going on to the database? Like, what is the difference? I know they're both going to give me similar matches and stuff, but what makes them different? So this, this is going to search a lot of different stuff pulled from a lot of different stores, right? right? Different locations, including a small subset of those databases. Right. So the, the real difference comes in, well, we've got a really broad database called Academic Search Premier. That's a good multidisciplinary database. It's going to look in a lot of different places. This search looks through that database, but the problem then becomes if it's also finding a bunch of stuff from other databases, everything on the shelf, all of our ebooks stuff from that database can get kind of lost in the mix, right? So I, I hesitate to call this like a library Google search, but that's the closest to what it is because it's going to search typically way more stuff than a database, but a database is usually a smaller set. Gotcha. So like um, if I, so in my field of like counseling psychology, like I don't want to use that big huge database. I only want things from like psych info or psych net. So if I click on that thing that says database, it's going to give me a list of topics that's specifically for me. So like if you wanted to study um, human development or if you want to study something in psychology, you can go to that specific database and only get stuff on psychology. If you use that regular academic search premier, you're going to get stuff from places that you may not even want. It's just going to make your research process harder. And again, it depends on where you're at. So, you know, if you're looking at an issue and you want research from different disciplines, how they're looking at concussions, maybe. So, like, what's the history of concussions versus the medical treatment of concussions versus gender issues in concussions? That, there's some more level med stuff there, but something like Academic Search Premier or that library search on the homepage might be more useful because it's going to pull in stuff from different disciplines. So again, it's, it's useful to try your search in multiple places. Um, this is that Psych Articles uh, database. So obviously it looks different than our library page. Um, it's like you walk in uh, a Walmart versus 
sprouts versus food pyramid, right? They all have the same basic functionality, but the look and feel is going to be a little bit different. The layout is going to be a little bit different. So I could put my uh, search terms here. And some of these databases act like Google, right? And they'll fill in these blanks and try to help. Okay, so language disorder. I get 351 versus what did we have on the regular 245,000. So again, a smaller set. Um, and then when you get in here, and remembering that each of these databases is going to look and feel a little bit different, you, know, you can browse around, take a closer look at one of these. Okay? So I always tell students that anytime you see a PDF option, go for it. Okay, a PDF. Remember, a lot of this stuff is still published in paper, and even if it's only digital, they still format it like it's a print copy, right? So this still has like page numbers, right? 72 through 75. They don't exist as these independent, uh, separate articles online only. Right? They kind of have this dual life. Um, so a PDF is going to give you a better layout. It's going to usually incorporate charts and graphs, if there are any, a little bit more effectively. Right, so like this table. Um, let's actually see what this looks like. On the web page if they have it. So in this case they have an image there, right? But it might not be as usable in some cases. A PDF prints reliably well. A web page is not going to print as well. So I think in, in almost all cases, a PDF is easier to use. You can email that file to yourself. You can save it. One of those other issues with the database is, since they're trying to lock you out, right? if you try to access this from off campus, you can't get to it. So let's say you copied and pasted that link up top, emailed it to yourself, went home for the summer and tried to access it, you got to hit a dead end. Okay? So what you have to do, you know, you want to get that PDF, in some cases, um, there are things called DOIs, Digital Object Identifiers. It doesn't look like this one has one, one I'm looking at. But if you ever see a DOI, that's like a permanent link. Save that. That's going to be useful later on. So that, that might come into play on down the road for you. Um, we talked about you know Wikipedia having Citations at the end, obviously. We talked about you know the parts of the article, and at the end, or maybe in the footnotes, you're going to have these references, right? It's 32. Will I have access to all this stuff on campus? No. It's easy. you don't have to log in if you're on campus. If you're off campus, I'll show you this real quick. So if you're off campus, and our, our website's about to change this summer, so I don't know how much different it's going to look, but you want to look for the anywhere library access or off campus access. So I scroll down and under this popular links, you got this, and you just log in with your OKE information. And keep that browser open, and you'll be able to you know, backtrack and jump into the databases from there. Um, the other cool thing is if you log in, and in our databases links, we have a link for Google Scholar. So if you go in through our website, from off campus, you'll also have these links. Okay? So Google Scholar is talking with our library, and it's providing access through Google Scholar to stuff that we have that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get if you weren't logged in. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Um, remember that. You're doing research, but it's not just you, right? You're not doing it in a vacuum. And I'm not just talking about your, your peers in the lab or your faculty mentors. You are doing research as part of a larger conversation, right? You have been impacted by an experience or a reading, right? That context has been provided to you. Um, you're doing research, maybe writing or presenting on it, sharing with others. And they're going to take that and maybe do the same thing, okay? 
So you're part of this longer continuum, this, this uh, greater context, this conversation. Um, and a way to kind of visualize that conversation is by looking at these references, right? So by taking a look here, we can see everything that the author of this article used in the creation of this, right? And that saves you a lot of legwork as well, because they've done a lot of the work, and you're simply going to build on it, right? Now, ethically, we have to give them credit, right? That's why you provide references and citations anyway, right? You're acknowledging the work that's come before you and your place in that conversation, okay? But I think sometimes the references get missed when you think about finding your resources. You spend all your time searching, you know, going through Google or a database, when you can start off and really kind of delve into the references and see what they have there. Now, it's really nice in this database They've linked these articles, so I should just be able to click on a link, and it's going to maybe take me directly to that article or to um, the journal homepage, right? So it took me out of that database and into this uh, journal website for the Journal of Neurosurgery, okay? And it took me directly to that article, looks like. Okay, so remember, like you find a really good source that's relevant, and that might open a whole lot of doors for you really easily, uh, and save you a lot of time and effort building that framework. Like, what's kind of like the line between like tying it and not tying it? Like, what if you just like read it, but you don't necessarily address like those topics of the article in your paper, but it still helps you get a better understanding. Right. You know? Occasionally, you'll see. Like works consulted, like if there's a difference between like a, a work cited and a works consulted area that varies by discipline. Um, sometimes a works consult or further reading, you'll see a section called further reading. So it's like if you want to read more about this general topic, or if you're interested in what helped me lay the groundwork for this, this is an area. Um, if you're pulling an idea uh, directly from an article, so not just even quotes, right? But if you're getting a an idea, something that's core to this article. If you're pulling that, then you need to sign it. Okay? And then you can, obviously, in the writing center can help with this, by the way. Um, you can do a quote, right? Pulling their direct words. You can do a paraphrase uh, or a summary, right? So a summary is just kind of summing it up. Uh, paraphrasing it is kind of shortening it, uh, putting it into your own words a little bit. Para paraphrasing, summarizing. But I'm still using their ideas, so I need to sign them, right? Um, if the stuff that you're just kind of consulting but not actually using, usually that doesn't get included, but occasionally it does in those other ways. Okay. Yeah. Is there any uh, built-in system to the database or within the library tools for an annotated bibliography? So what we can do. Um, there are some options, okay? Now, by the way, on your, one of your handouts, right? I've got a bunch of links on there. On the fourth bullet, and fifth bullet, there's something called Zotero. Okay, has anyone heard of Zotero before? Fantastic. Do you What's use that? it? Or you just kind of you know about it? Okay. So, I don't know. Zotero is a free, open source, open meaning that programmers can get it and and program it and, and create new tools using it free and share them with others. So that's pretty cool. It's not tied to OSU in any way, so you don't have to log in with your OSU credentials. When you graduate, you go to grad school, it's not gonna you're not gonna lose access, right? It's yours. It's been free for a long time and I it will be free forever. I do not see this selling out like other companies. Um, so Caro can be used for managing your citations and generating your bibliography. It's really helpful on annotated bibs. Um, and I can't show you here because it's not downloaded on my computer. But I'll tell you that link will provide you um, with this website, the library, that gives you a tutorial. Um, walks you through the process. And so what you'll end up doing is you'll download this tool. But there's two parts. There's a part that sits on your desktop, on your computer. And there's a part that goes in your browser. So you'll see it up in the corner, right? This little icon. And what you can do is when you're on 
a website, a YouTube video, a um, Flickr photo, an academic article. You click that button up there, and it's going to add, the, we call it the metadata, right? So all the information about this, the title, author, journal, volume issue, page number, all this stuff, abstract, it throws it into the Zotero management system. And that allows you to have some note-taking functions. So I could say, you know, this article, I can do my annotated bit with it. I can write my notes as, as part of this. Um, I can write comments about, you know, use this article in my opening paragraph. Refer to it here. I can make connections between this article and that article, right? You can create these, these connections in there. You can add your own tags, okay? So terms that are meaningful to you. You can create different folders for different projects or different components of that project. It's a really cool, and I think it's, there's a little bit of learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty easy. Huh? No, but there are annotation tools. Um, at the end, let me try to find one, because there's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Like I, I think it's called Hypothesis. Yes, okay. So, hypothesis. I haven't played around with this in a while, but it lets you annotate web pages and articles. I don't know if you can integrate PDFs in there, but it also lets you collaborate. So you're able to comment on content that's online, and you know your lab partner or whoever on another campus can also annotate that as well and let you add them, okay? Um, you can also annotate in the PDF as well, uh, in Adobe. I haven't done that uh, there's some options here. Uh, if you ever, by the way, if you know, I leave, if you still have questions, email me the questions and I'll give you the answer. Um, also, Zotero just released this thing called Zotero Vid. Um, and it is quick and easy to create bibliographies on the fly. So it's not necessarily, it's not going to be as useful for large scale projects when you're managing a whole lot of resources, you're taking notes and stuff like that. But if you need to just create a bibliography or a reading list really quickly, this is fantastic. So that link is on your paper as well. And I'll just show you an example here. Probably can't see this, but it says enter a URL ISBN, DOI, PMID, or archive ID or title, right? So you can search a lot of different information. I mentioned that DOI, right? Well, okay, I'll show you one. I could search by this article title. So I can just be in Zotero Bib. I can plug an article title in there. Okay, and it found it, right? So I can select it. Sometimes it's going to find multiple items. I can select it, and then it adds it to my bibliography, right? So I could come in. If there's anything that's kind of wrong with it, maybe there's some typos, I can edit it. I can also change my bibliography style. So it's in MLA now. But I could change it to APA. I could change it to, I think they said they had 9,000 styles in there. It's ridiculous. Um, they'll tell me that the shift from one style to another requires some changes that I might have to manually edit. Um, I can create a link to this. And so I can share it with myself or others, and we can work on it together to build up this list. There are, I think, more options than I had initially thought with this. Again, it's still not as robust as regular Zotero. It just depends on your need. Right? So you need to use them quick, you want to use the other thing. You want to do long term research projects, annotated bibs, use Zotero. Okay? Uh, I'm happy to later in the semester if we want to have a workshop or something on Zotero, I can do one of those too. Okay, any other questions on Zotero? Um, what to mention? Oh, also.
also in databases to Google Drive directly from the database, which is super handy because for a long time I would just have students download a PDF and then you know open Google and then save it that way for their desktop. That's going to save time. Um, if you create an account in this database, which by the way, this, this is useful information though, I think. The database itself is called Site Articles, but it's provided by this vendor called EBSCO, right? And EBSCO is like this monstrous business that has many, many databases, right? So think of like EBSCO as the mall and Site Articles as a store in that mall, okay? Um, Within EBSCO databases, if you create an account, you can add it to a folder, right? So you can build up this folder of all these resources, uh, save them, print them as in, in bulk, whatever you need to do. You can print the article, email it, save it, cite it. So this is another citation option. If I click cite, it's going to give me all these styles that I can choose from, right? So I can copy that APA one right into uh, a Word document. You can also export citation files. So Sotero uses these files, um, they're called RIS files. And so even though they don't say, they refer to all these bibliographic management tools, EndNote, ProSite, Reference Management, Refworks, and Text, even though they don't say Zotero in there, still export it that way, okay? So this export in RIS format, Zotero is listed here. So I can just export that right to Zotero. So various options to get that thing in your, your management system, okay? All right. So what if you what if you're reading an article, or maybe a uh, faculty member you're working with gives you a citation and says, this book or this article would be really good. So you have the citation, you say, okay, we'll find this. You could go here, obviously you could search for the book title. You could go to that full text journals option and use this thing called a citation finder and plug in the article title, journal title, etc., and see if you can find it that way. So some options there, but what if you still can't find a PDF or, or the full text of the article or that book, especially books is where it comes into play most often. If you can't figure out how to get to it, number one, let us know, um, ask questions, or you could try this trick, which is on the home page, or something called WorldCat. So the last bullet I have on your page, I say remember that WorldCat can be used to request items from other institutions. Okay? So that's going to take you um, off of our page, right? And again, this works like databases. If you're on campus, it's going to recognize that you're coming to it from Oklahoma State. If you're off campus, you need to log in before you do that. Okay? So what I can do is uh, Plug in my language disorder search. They break it down uh, on these tabs by different types of resources. So I could look for a book. If I plug in a title, right, it's going to come up with the title. This just gives me a way to kind of search around. So if OSU has a copy, it's going to say it. It's going to highlight it, and then you can know, oh, I can just go find it in our, our space. If it's not, it won't list it. Okay, but what I could do is I jump in this, it's called a record, and I get more information about the book. I could actually see the over 2,000 other libraries that own it, and this is geographically organized, so we're going to see like a, a bunch of public libraries here, right? Bartlesville, Catoosa, uh, Cherokee City, County Library, Chickasha, all these Oklahoma libraries. I can then click borrow from another library. Then you just use your O key. What's 
great is it fills it in for you, right? This request form. It plugs in an author title, date, an ISBN number. That's another useful thing. If you can, if you have a book, the ISBN number will be great if you need to request it. The ISBN number, um, some other criteria. If you want a physical book, then you need to select this because they may send you an e-copy. I, for books, like journals, I have no problem reading these on the screen, right? But if I'm supposed to read like a 400 page thing, that's not a, you know, a novel. I hate reading it on a tablet or a computer screen. So select that if you want a hard copy of something, okay? And then you just submit it. And then what happens is um, you can look at your outstanding request. So I have some stuff that has come, I think everything's come in now, but it'll tell you if your item's out, and once it comes in, you can either pick it up at the desk, or if it's like a, an article, or even a book chapter, you can request specific chapters out of books, and Harvard will scan that in, and they'll email it to us, and it will be in this system. You can download it from here, print it, save it, whatever you need. Okay? It is an incredibly handy tool, especially for, for research. Um, gives you access to essentially the world of information out there that's not necessarily digitized at this point. Um, and it doesn't cost anything else. I always I never say free because you guys have already paid for so many sources and resources here, right? You pay a lot of money for them on top of tuition. So I want you to take advantage of them and use them. Okay? Um, one other thing I forgot to mention, when you're in those articles, looking at the, the references, not only are you finding more about that conversation, but you're also identifying like experts, right? The other people who are involved in that conversation. And so if you know that hey, Dr. Smith is at LSU doing research on the very topic that I'm interested in, learn more about Dr. Smith. Go to LSU, you know, the Department of Neurology, find their webpage, look at her information about you know, where she graduated, other publications, what project she's working on now. Do a little bit of digging, and then maybe that's a contact in the future, right? Maybe that's someone, somewhere you want to go to grad school, that's a faculty member you want to be a mentor, or has a, has a mentor. Um, build up this set of resources and contacts in your, your head on paper, uh, and figure out what your next steps are, okay? All right. And I want to point out, we have, does anyone know about our undergraduate library research report? You heard of that? Yeah, I'm it. So, and I think next year we're changing the day to March, uh, the deadline. But if you have your research paper, project, poster, painting, video, whatever form your research project takes. If that's done or close to done by March, you can submit that to our award. Um, and what we've done in the past, we're going to change this up. I'm not certain exactly how and what extent. Uh, but in the past, what we've done is we ask you to submit your project, right? Most of the time, it's a research paper. Um, we ask you to then write like a 750 to 1,000 word essay on the research process as it pertains to finding and using information. So like what I've talked about today. So it's not necessarily just the lab portion of the field research. It is how did you lay the groundwork? What databases did you use? What struggles did you encounter? How did you change your search terms when you discovered this wouldn't work, right? So, that information part of the research. Um, so you can go here and take a look at our winners since 2014, uh, learn a bit more about their research, how they've used the library, resources they found particularly useful. And uh, we have right now two categories. We have underclassmen and upperclassmen. And we offer, although it's changed a little bit here, year, a $1,500 award in upperclassmen and underclassmen for winner and a $750 award for a runner-up in each category. Okay. Um, I would love to, we're, we're making the deadline a little earlier this year, 
hopefully to get a few more applicants. Um, I'll just tell you right now, we've had, I think, 20 applicants max, right? So that's still, that's that's pretty good odds. You know, if every one of you got in there and we had even 30 applicants, that's pretty good odds to win pretty decent money. Um, and I think, I'll tell you this too, the changes I would like to make for the spring is to make the essay a little bit simpler um, and more straightforward in having you explain what your experience was in the library. Basically saying, how did the library and the library services and resources help me complete this research? Okay. So that's, that's my goal there. Um, the changes will hopefully occur by the end of the fall semester, so in spring when you're applying, if you're applying, all those changes will be made, okay? Um, the other two handouts I gave you, you may have seen before, especially this one. Uh, this is just our basics for undergrads page. This isn't specific to you know, researchers or anything.